Methodists that are thinking, you know what, I'll just stay in bed and I'll watch online this morning because it's a fun-loving bunch and I'm sure some people had some fun last night, so that's all right. That's all right. It's good to see you all here this morning as, as we began the new year. And um, I'm not going to, we'll have announcements at the end, but I, I, I do want to say, you know, at the beginning of the year, uh, before we launch headlong into a whole new year with all of its activities, it's, you know, sometimes I think it's good for us individually and us as a church, just both spiritually and just for our own mental health, I think, to kind of stop and reflect on where you've been so you can get your bearings on where you're going can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And so whether we do that prayerfully or whether we just, however you do it, I think prayerfully here, but but just reflect on where have we been over the past year. And if I do that just as a church family, I look back over, we did this whole capital campaign thing, and we squeezed that into the year, and we buckled down and got that done. And we've our, we've moved our breaking bonds outfit, and they've continued to grow and flourish. We've got a new band, pretty much. I mean, we've got the same drummer, but we've got... <laughs> yeah. We've got a, a, a new great band. Um, we've got a, a brand new but yet still old facility at, at the high street. Just all the things that we've done and just all the ministry that's happen and the lives we've touched through our hope for Christmas and all of our other stuff with the school district. So if we, we stop and we think about those things and we, at least me, I wonder how in the world we pull that off. Well, we didn't. God did. All we did was say yes. God took care of the rest. But also as we look back and we reflect on things, we, we know that there were some hard times in each of our individual lives. There was things that we struggled through. There's things that we struggled through as a church. We also thank God for those things because they remind us of, of how much we have to rely on God to sustain us through those hard times. How much we have to, when we don't know the next step to take, we just take the next step, realizing that God's walking there right beside us. So we thank God for the hard times and the challenges too. I just think it's important that we do that before we, <laughs> and I know how this church is, we, we move at about 800 miles an hour, we'll launch into this next year and not give 2022 a second thought, but we really need to stop and thank God for the blessing of the year that's gone by and ask God for the blessing of, of the year to come. So let's pray, and then we'll get started with worship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that, that you have put in our path over this past 12 months, blessings within our individual lives, within our families, within our church family. Lord, we thank you for those, and, and we ask you to forgive us when we don't, for the times we don't take time to acknowledge your presence and your blessings among us. And Lord, as we look back and give you thanks, we also look forward, and we ask that you lead and guide us through the year to come. Lord, we don't always know what's coming down the pike, but you do. Our job is to just continue to diligently seek you, to diligently look for you and to, and to ask for your wisdom and guidance to show us what next step to take. Lord, as we launch headlong into this new year, we ask that you renew our commitment our commitment as individuals, as, as families, and certainly as a church family to just diligently seek you and to go wherever you lead us. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you came to worship, and if you're willing, and if you're able, stand with us.
Thank you, Ben. Good job, Riley. You may have a seat. Uh, before, I want everybody to stand and greet one another in just a second, but first of all, I got my, my family, most of them, sitting right here. I'm not going to introduce all of them. I don't remember the names. It's not important. <laughs> I got two sisters in St. Louis, one of which is here, two brothers that live in Kansas City, and they're both here, and mom and dad, the ones that's responsible for this mess are sitting right up here, but it's great to have them here trashing your parsonage um, for the New Year's weekend. We've had a good time. we got a Chiefs game to play after this, so we will get home in time, Pop, I promise. Don't worry about it. But it's good to have family here. Now, stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ.
So um, in a few moments, we'll have the ushers come forward, and, and we'll get back to God, some of our first and our best, and Amanda's dancing back there, which means that the kids are now released also for uh, Children's Church. You can head on back for that as well. Right back to that door there. So before we do that, let me offer us a, a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll have our offering. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with every good gift. You're a God who loves us, and you're a God who invites us to respond to that love, to participate in that love. And so, Lord, as we give back some of our first and our best to you in response to your love, we ask that you multiply it, you magnify it, and, Lord, you use it to be light and love in somebody else's life. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
This morning's scripture comes from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw a star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people, or my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time uh, when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. This is the word of God for the people. Well, this is a Epiphany Sunday. Does that mean anything to anybody? Anybody know what Epiphany is? Mark? No? All right. I'm going to tell you. Um, before we get to that, I just want to preface this whole thing by saying, and I, I firmly believe this is true, that there's just something about Jesus that demands a response from us, doesn't it? There's just something about about God's movement, God sending his son to us that just demands a response from us. It just can't be ignored. We can either believe it or not believe it. You know, we can accept it, we can reject it, we can follow, we can not follow. But either way, we got to respond. We got to respond. One way or another, God the Father, the creator of all creation, is going to confront you, going to confront me, And one way or another, we have to respond. Now, how we respond, of course, is is completely up to us. You know, we have this pesky little thing called free will. We can respond however we're going to respond. We can decide that. But we don't have a choice when it comes to responding. We got to make a choice. It's not an option to just not respond. And that reality, I think, is what Epiphany Sunday and what the season of Epiphany, the weeks that that follow this Sunday, are really all about. So with that in mind, and before we get get too far into the scripture that, that Pastor Brandon read to us, let's make sure we're all on the same page with with regard to Epiphany Sunday, this Sunday, and the season that is to follow. Now, Epiphany, it's a church tradition. Let's just call it what it is. It's traditionally held the the first Sunday after Christmas. And the first Sunday after Christmas, the scripture verses that we just read is is what's traditionally read. And the sermon that I'm about to preach on Epiphany is the message that's, that's traditionally preached. And it's, in the Catholic world, it's known as the, the Feast of Epiphany. Now, like many traditions in the church, it's just meant to be a teaching tool, right? You won't find the word epiphany in the Bible. 
so don't bother looking it up. But that doesn't mean that this church tradition doesn't point to and illuminate biblical truths as we practice this celebration, this feast. And even before we get into all that, um, it's pretty important that we know the definition of the word epiphany. And as I was putting this message together, it dawned on me that your pastor didn't necessarily know the actual definition of the word epiphany. Sorry to say. Yeah, it's nuts. So what do you do when you don't know the definition of something? You crank up the old Google machine and you look it up. And I did that, and what I found was there's a couple definitions to, to the word epiphany. There's kind of a, a secular definition to the word. It's, it's the word that we kick around a lot, not really know what it means, but we kick around anyway. And that, that definition of the word epiphany goes like this. It's an illuminating discovery or realization. An illuminating discovery or realization. And as soon as I read that on the Google machine, the first thing that came to my mind were those, those cartoons that we used to watch as kids, or some of us still watch, and when, when one of the cartoon characters has this bright idea, what happens? You get this light bulb that pops up above their head, right? So that, that would be kind of the secular version of the epiphany. Now, the church's definition of epiphany is, is a bit more heady um, and a bit more meaningful, I think. The church's definition is the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. The manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, which makes a lot of sense because the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles is exactly what's represented in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, which we just read. You can't get any more Gentile, any more pagan than the Magi, than the wise men. And it's the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. So that's why we traditionally read these verses on Epiphany Sunday. Now, I know for many of you, these are, especially lifelong Methodists, these are very familiar, this is a very familiar text. And again, it's read every year about pretty much on this Sunday. It's read every year on Epiphany Sunday, which is today. And Epiphany Sunday, like I said, it's really usually the first Sunday after, after Christmas. And it starts the Epiphany season and the Epiphany season goes all the way to Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of the Lenten season. So there's, depending on the year, there's four to six weeks of the Epiphany season. Now, I've got a theory about, about this story we just read and about, and about the Epiphany season in general. I think that this story we just read, and it relates back to these responses to Christ, this familiar story that we just read is comprised of, of three main characters. There's three main characters characters in this story, and each of those characters represent a different response to Jesus, a different response to the Christ child, a different response to Emmanuel, which is God who's come to be with us. So there's, there's three characters, and each character represents a different response. The first character, of course, is the Magi, is the, the wise men who came from out east. Now, they're the heroes of the story. These are the guys, they're, they're pagan astrologers, and, and they're from some distant land. And they respond to the realization of Christ. They respond with worship. And it's kind of unlikely and ironic when you think about this, because this these 12 verses, this story about the Magi, the story about the wise men, it only shows up in Matthew. It's not in the other three gospel messages. But remember, Matthew wrote his gospel. He's a Jew writing specifically to Jews. And here it is in the second chapter of his gospel. And what's he doing? He's making pagans. He's making Gentiles the hero of the story. And he's making the Jews kind of not so much the hero of the story. So it's kind of ironic that, that Matthew would include this in his gospel. But yet he does. So these magi who don't really know anything about Judaism. They don't know they're supposed to be looking for a Messiah, yet they respond, and they respond with worship. Then we have the second character, of course, and that is, you know, every story's got to have a villain, right? So the villain is Herod, King Herod. He's the villain of the story, and he's a very well-qualified villain. He's good at it. 
when he's presented with the realization that God has fulfilled his promise and he has sent his Messiah, Herod responds with hostility. We've got the Magi responding with worship. Herod responds with hostility. Now, the heroic Magi and, and the dastardly Herod, you know, those are, those are pretty easy to identify. It doesn't take an English major to pick those out of the story. And their corresponding responses are also, they're, they're also fairly obvious. But this character number three is not so obvious. This character number three is the nameless, faceless residents of Jerusalem, whom are all Jews. And in this story, they're represented by the Jewish leading priests and the scribes, the people who, who knew all about historically and theologically, knew all about the prophecies that all pointed to the coming of the Messiah and where he was to be born in Bethlehem. It says so in, in 2 Samuel, and it definitely says so in, in Micah's prophecy, because that's what they quote in these scripture verses. So this group, this group is this nameless crowd represented by these leading priests and these scribes, and when they find out, when they're confronted with the realization of Christ's birth, they respond with indifference. They're just indifferent. They don't do anything. This third character is neither heroic and they're, nor are they hostile. They're just indifferent. The Magi worship. Herod was hostile. And he, was, he went into a jealous rage. The leading priests, the scribes, and the citizens of Jerusalem, they collectively shrug their shoulders at the whole thing. So let me ask you, has much changed in the past 2,000 years? Has much changed? Each one of us, in our own way, whether we're a collection of church members or, or whether in our individual lives, at some point, at multiple points in our lives, we're going to be confronted with the reality of Christ. And we're going to have to respond. One way or another, we're going to have to respond. We can respond with worship. We can respond with hostility. Or we can blow it off and respond with indifference. That's why I think this story is so important and why this tradition of epiphany that's all this old church stuff is so important and prevalent even more today. Times have changed. People haven't. So let's dig a bit deeper into our story and see how these, these responses and these characters play out. So we'll start with the wise men. What do we know about the wise men? Well, honestly, honestly, we, we don't know much. I mean, if you watch the Hallmark Channel or you, you one of those things, Hollywood, you think you know a lot about them, but you really don't. There's not much in Matthew's gospel factoids about the Magi. They, they're kind of in this shroud of mystery. But what little we do know and what little is revealed by Matthew in the gospel is, is really all we need to know when you think about it. So here's what we can know for sure from Matthew's gospel, and then here's some things that I think we can pretty, pretty safely and confidently infer from the information that's provided. First thing we know is they were astrologers. They were stargazers, astrologers. You know, when they, when, they, when they go to finally show up in Jerusalem, which is kind of not where they were supposed to show up, but they show up in Jerusalem, and the first thing they say is, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. Now, I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have looked into this, this clear, dark sky and seen a gazillion stars up there. You think any one of us would notice if one new star appeared out of all those gazillions up there, us lay people, we probably wouldn't. I know I wouldn't. But these guys did. These guys were astrologers. And so they noticed this, this, new, this new astrological phenomenon up there, and it spoke to them. God used a star to speak to the Magi. Now, when he was communicating Christmas stuff to the Jews, of course, he used angels. You know, he was talking to Mary and talking to Zachariah, and he was talking to Joseph. Angels were the preferred means of communication. 
But angels would have fallen on deaf ears with the Magi. These guys weren't Jews. They were astrologers. So the, an angel would have shown up to one of these astrologers, and they'd think to themselves, whew, shouldn't have had pizza that close to bedtime, because that's just weird. But God spoke to them in a language they could understand, which was some sort of astrological phenomenon. And it spoke to them. So we know they were astrologers, and they were probably pretty good at it because they noticed a new star in the sky. We also know that they, because it says so in Scripture, that they came from the east. Now, in that part of the world, there's Palestine, and east of Palestine, you know what's there? Nothing. The Saudi Arabian desert. And trust me, there ain't nothing there. You got to go five to 800 miles, keep going, and you finally get to the Persian Gulf. You finally get to the coast of what is today known as Saudi Arabia, which is where most theologians and historians think that they would have hailed from, or possibly just a little bit to the, to the east northeast, you go to end up in Baghdad, modern day Baghdad, Babylonian. That's where they might have come from. But either way, to get from either of those two places, they have got to cross five to 800 miles of almost a part of the earth that you'd swear that God forgot to finish. I mean, it's just desolate. There's nothing there. So they would have had to travel who knows how long from the east to get to Palestine, to get to Jerusalem and then ultimately Bethlehem. Now, the other thing we can infer from that then is they were probably men of great means. They probably had a lot of money because they would have had to have this huge logistics operation to transport all the food and all the water, because if you want to eat and drink in the Saudi Arabian desert, you better have brought something with you, because there ain't nothing there. So they would have had to have this huge logistics train that would have sustained them all the way, as they went on foot, all the way across the desert and as they made their way. So that would have cost them something. And they would have had probably this huge entourage of servants and whatnot with them to support them along the way. So it wasn't just three guys like we see on the Hallmark cards. There would have been an army of folks in tow with those. And we also know they were men of means because look what they brought to the, for baby gifts. You know, it wasn't diaper wipes and a, and a onesie. It was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's what rich people bring to a baby shower. So, so we know they were men of means. We know they came from a long way out in the east. And we also understand, we can also conclude that they knew absolutely nothing about Hebrew Scripture. You know, they were kind of shooting in the dark. They responded to God based upon very little information. And how often do we have the faith to do that? You know, we always want to know how it's going to end before we start. These guys didn't have a clue. Had they had a clue, they would have known, they would have understood the most basic prophecy in Scripture is that, hey, we need to go to Bethlehem because that's where the king of the Jews is going to be born. It says so in several places in the Old Testament. But no, what they do, they end up going to Jerusalem. They miss their mark by six and a half miles. They go to Jerusalem, and they're not going there to see King Herod. They're going there to ask directions. They're looking for the newborn king of the Jews, and they just assumed that somebody in Jerusalem would know something about it, because that's where all the Jews hang out, and would have been able to tell them where to go. Had they had the least bit of information, other than just a little bit God had revealed to them, they would have already known to go to Bethlehem. And that leads us to our, our second character and the second response. So they end up in Jerusalem. Now, again, you've got this big old entourage of people, and you've got these rich dignitaries that show up in town. And, you know, Jew Jerusalem's not exactly a diverse place. Everybody there is a Jew. They act like Jews. They talk like Jews. They're Jews. And now you've got these pagans, not just a, a few of them, but a bunch of pagans showing up in town. They were noticed. So... Although they didn't go there looking for Herod, Herod got wind that they were there. Now, the thing you need to know about Herod was he was a psycho, and that's putting it nicely. He was a, a tyrant. Herod thought he was the king of the Jews, and Herod was this, this paranoid, jealous guy who always felt threatened. Case in point, he had 10 wives and 12 sons. He killed most of them because they were a threat to his power. And if we read ahead a few verses, 
to about verse 16, 17, can't remember, in Matthew chapter 2, we'll find that Herod was so outraged at the thought of this newborn king of the Jews that he just went in and killed all the males under two years old, two years and under, in Bethlehem. That's how crazy this guy was. So, anyway, they, they're in the, the wise men are in, in Jerusalem. Herod invites them in for a meeting. Why are you here? We're here to, to worship the newborn king of the Jews. How do you know anything about him? Well, we saw a star rise. When did it rise? They tell, the, the wise men tell Herod. Herod turns to his leading priests and his scribes, the experts, the theologians, and says, what's all this about? He said, yeah, the, the prophecy says that in Bethlehem Ephrata, that's where the, the, the new you know, ruler of Israel would, would be, and he'll reign forever. Herod's mind blows up. So now he gets into this manipulation mode and says, hey, wise man, Bethlehem, um, go there and check it out and come back and let me know so I can go worship too. By worship, he means kill. That was his plan. So he responds with hostility. He responds to the Christ child with hostility. You got to respond. He chose hostility. But what about those leading priests and scribes and all the Jews they represented? They knew to look for the coming of the Messiah. And now you've got these, these pagans, even if it's not true, even if it's like, oh, these guys are crazy, you'd think you'd still go the five miles and check it out for yourself. And they did nothing. They did nothing. But God had a plan, and as soon as the wise men finally figure out that they're, they, they missed their mark by five miles, and they start heading south, the star arises over the place where the, where the Christ child and his, and his young family were. There's something in Scripture, it's, it's in Matt, um, Hebrews chapter 11, it said, God rewards those who diligently seek him. God rewards those who diligently seek him. How much more diligent can you possibly be than those, those magi who crossed that desert and and showed up not even really understanding. They were there to worship a baby who was a foreign king that they really knew nothing about. But they were rewarded because they met the newborn king. And they were able to worship him and give him gifts, the same gifts that, that would probably, were probably used as currency that the Holy Family then traveled to Egypt as they were trying to outrun crazy King Herod. God had a plan for all this, and God rewarded them. But you know how the interesting thing and the way that God rewarded them is it says in, the, I think, the second to last verse of what we read that, that when it was after they'd worshipped, when it was time to go home, God didn't just send another star. God spoke to them in a dream. And they must have understood because they didn't go back to Herod. They went home by a different route. See, they gave God their worship. God gave them wisdom, his protection, and his guidance to go home by a different route. So I bring all this up at this time of year and on this particular Sunday as we start the new year because once again we have an opportunity to respond to the love of Christ. Now we can we can respond with our worship. We can diligently seek. And God will reward with his guidance and his wisdom, his protection. To give us courage as we launch into this new year, not really knowing where we're going, kind of like the wise men. We can respond with hostility. And by virtue of the fact that you're here this morning, you know, hopefully that's off the table. Um, but what's not off the table is the option of indifference. The option to to take this, this gift that we just celebrated last week and to pack it away with the rest of our Christmas junk and put it in boxes, put it in storage, break it out again next year when it's Christmas season. That's indifference. See, indifference is a dangerous thing to choose. It's a very dangerous thing because indifference is transitory. You don't just stay indifferent. You can stay worshipful. You can stay hostile. But indifference, you can't stay there. You're either going to go one way or the other, ultimately. And that shows up in Scripture, too, because those same indifferent people in Jerusalem, those same, those same leading priests and scribes, fast forward 30 years. 
They're the same ones yelling, crucify him. They chose a side. They ultimately chose a side. You can't just stay indifferent. God requires a response. He leaves it up to you to choose. And you get to live with the consequences. But God also says, God rewards those who diligently seek him. And my prayer for us as we launch into this, this crazy new year, probably every bit as crazy as it was last year, that we just focus on one thing. Just diligently seek God. And he'll take care of the rest. Happy New Year. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the many ways that you teach us. Thank you for the wisdom of church fathers and mothers that come up with things like epiphany for us to, to latch on to and to glean new truths from your, from your word. Thank you for the example of not just the, the magi, the wise men, but the, the many other people that have crossed our paths in our history and in our own lives that have that have shown us that what it is to respond with diligent worship, the people that, that set that example for us. And Lord, we pray for those who, who greet you with hostility. We know that you're a God of, of redemption. You're a God of life, not death. And Lord, if people are willing to change, you can turn that hostility to worship. So Lord, we pray for those people as well. And Lord, we certainly pray for those who, who just muddle through life with this indifference to your presence, who muddle through life with indifference to your constant outpouring of love in, in big ways or in just small mundane ways in the course of our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, we pray that those people will stop and see you in their midst. And Lord, I pray that, that each one of us, each one of us can can diligently seek you, and as we do, we end up being reflectors of your light and your love. Lord, we thank you for using us to, to shine light into dark places so that others can make a choice. And maybe through our example, choose to, choose to worship you. And Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for inviting us to participate in your love for us. And we thank you for using us to share your love with others. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Where's my bullet? There it is. Before we head out, I just have a, a couple things I want to call your attention to. About the first five or six things on your on the announcement part of your bulletin all have to do with our next generation ministries. It has to do with extreme camp and youth mission trips, disciple now, summer day camp, all these things. This is the time of year, even though we're planning for stuff way out in summer, um, this is the time of year we can get some early bird discounts and and, and whatnot for, for signing up for our, our church camps. So be sure if you got kids and that affects you, be sure and pay attention to that as well. So and we also have our men's retreat coming up um, on the 27th through the 29th of January. So, so gentlemen, um, if you haven't signed up already, then mm, hate it for you. You need to get signed up. So it's going to be a good weekend. It's going to be a good weekend. I think that's, I think that's all we have in terms of announcements. Um, but I want to say to each of you, have a, have a blessed and a happy new year. Um, Lord knows what he's got in store for his new McKendry family this year. Uh, but... If the, the pattern holds true, it'll be something, it'll be crazy, and it'll be good. So, so I look forward to serving with you in the, in the year to come. So let's bow your heads, and, and I'll offer us a blessing. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. Lord, as we leave here, may we leave here diligently seeking you, diligently seeking your presence in our lives so that we can be a light that shines into the lives of others. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.